Uh, I want to welcome Kathy back with us today. Good to see you back and, and healing up. And uh, Jim Flecka just shared with me, uh, he would like for us to remember uh, his son-in-law uh, this week in prayer. His mother died uh, Friday. Saturday, Saturday morning. Saturday morning. Okay. That's Kathy's husband. Kathy's husband. Okay. Uh, and she been sick long? Yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. How old was she? I don't even know. Okay. Well, remember, remember them in prayer. Okay. Awesome. John got two. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, we we've already. Let's have a dancing contest between John and oh, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> I can do the stork. Yeah. yeah, we already. Johnny was back. He's been back two weeks. Yeah. That's what happens when I miss. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 16 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. Revelation 16. We'll begin with verse 1. So if you'll go to 16 1, you can be ready to follow along with me in a moment as I read. And if you don't have your Bible, then Mike will be faithful to have them up on the screen. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. And so we're moving along pretty pretty rapidly, really, uh, in this study of the Revelation. Uh, we've only got what, six more chapters after this. So we're moving moving good. <clears throat> Revelation 16, 1. John writes and says, Then I heard a voice from the temple say, Let me read that again. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Here John hears this loud voice coming from uh, the temple. And uh, this tells us that this is a command then uh, from God because it's coming from the, the temple in heaven. The voice speaks to the seven angels and instructs them to go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Now the pouring out of the seven bowls of the wrath of God corresponds to a prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, verse 21. It says this, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So that's that's Jesus' prophecy of this event that John is also prophesying about, which is an event that is still yet to come, but uh, I believe soon to come. Uh, Jesus uses the word uh, great tribulation as he refers to the last 42 months of the tribulation period. And we know that that 42 months is the same thing as three and a half years, 1260 days, and times, times, and a half time. All of those are used to refer to the same <coughs> period of time. Now, we have seen the seven angels uh, in their seal judgments. We have seen the seven angels in the trumpet judgments. All of those were in the first half of the tribulation. But now comes the bold judgments, and uh, these will be by far the most severe of all the judgments <clears throat> that God is going to pour out on sinful man in the last days. Verse 2. So the first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. So the first angel pours out his bowl on the earth, and it becomes these malignant sores that are on the people who have worshipped the beast and taken his mark. Now without question, we know that this takes place 
uh, at the uh, shortly after the midterm of the seven-year tribulation. Uh, we know this uh, because the mark of the beast and the worshiping of the beast and his image cannot occur until after the middle of the seven-year tribulation. We talked about this quite a lot a few weeks ago, but some of you may not have been here. <clears throat> so be very mindful of the fact when you hear somebody coming along some event takes place or whatever and, and they say well that's going to be the mark of the beast don't do that that's the mark of the beast that's really ridiculous biblically because the mark of the beast cannot happen until the mid part of the tribulation and as we've talked through the years the church is going to be raptured prior to the beginning of the tribulation so the closest you and I as Christians are going to get to the mark of the beast is three and a half years away. That's the closest we can get. Okay? And that's the, that's the biblical scriptural truth. That's the closest a Christian is going to get to the mark of the beast. Now, I know that's quite a bold statement. But if you look at Scripture closely, you will realize that is a true statement concerning Scripture. Now, uh, he goes on here and we talk about the word sore. These sores, malignant sores that were on people. This is the same word that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And, and that Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament is the Septuagint seen that word and not known what it was it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament now also you will see it sometimes as LXX okay that's the same thing except to it's Greek translation of the Old Testament so that word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is translated as boils not sores and it's uh, used in the uh, plagues that the Egyptians were experiencing when the children of Israel were being brought out of bondage in Egypt. Thus, these are literal cancer sores that will appear on all those who have taken the mark of the beast as a result of their worship of, of the image of the beast. Notice the fact that the sores and the boils appear on those who have received the mark of the beast. But they do not appear on those who are are Christians that are still alive at that time that have not received the mark of the beast. The, the cancer sores don't appear on them. It's very much like they're exempt from that, just like the children of Israel were exempt from the sores and the boils and all the plagues that happened in, in Egypt. Uh, the death angel and all of that. They had uh, the blood over the doorpost of the lentil and the, the death angel passed but he uh, killed the firstborn uh, in a son in each of the uh, families of Egypt. So there's an exemption there uh, in which uh, the people that have not taken the mark, that are alive at that period of time, they will not receive those. Now verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. The second angel pours out his bowl on the sea. And it resulted in the sea becoming blood like that of a dead man. Now, uh, if you cut yourself and you bleed, you see what your blood looks like. Okay? But it doesn't take long if you don't clean that blood off of your skin or whatever. You see what blood looks like real soon after, after it, it comes out of the body. It changes. It's, it's different. Okay? And so the blood of a dead man is different than the blood of that person when it was still flowing through their veins. And so this is, this is talking then about blood on the sea, and it's like a dead man. It's, it's not 
it's, it's different than what's flowing in our body. Its appearance is different. Now, the sea turned to blood naturally kills everything in the sea. Okay? It, it can't live. So, can you imagine the sea, and particularly people living in coastal areas around the sea, where this event has taken place? Can you imagine the smell? of everything in the sea floating to the top and dead and rotting. And then and then the smell of blood that's like a dead man that's dried and all. Blood smells different. Uh, it, it's just different smelling. Uh, and, and it's even worse smelling, I guess, after it gets dried and coagulated and all of those kind of things. But this is the description here. Uh, of, of what we see uh, at this uh, outpouring of this bowl. Now verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters and they became blood. We're really getting serious now. The third angel pours out his bowl, the rivers and the springs of waters. This is all the fresh water and they become blood also. Now, we all know that one of man's basic needs is water. You can go without food for quite a while. There are people in the Bible who fasted 40 days and lived. I know of people who fasted 40 days, uh, some multiple times. And, and they go without food for 40 days. But you can only go without water for about three or four days. So when you see uh, the springs of water, the rivers, all the freshwater sources uh, turn to blood like this, then you realize that God is going to have to do something miraculously to provide fresh water or the people are going to have to get some type of purification system going or something quickly. Because when this happens, if something is not done to provide fresh water, then it's going to bring the destruction of, of, of every living uh, being on earth sooner than what, this, what the revelation says it's going to be the end. So something is going to happen to provide uh, water at this time. But it's, it's going to make it difficult to obtain that water. And of course a lot of people no doubt will die before they have the opportunity to get whatever fresh water is is made available or drinking water is made available. So you can see that the first one was bad in the loss of uh, the fishing industry, let's say. And a, a lot of people live off of the sea, okay? A lot of people, main source of food is from the sea. A lot of that will be gone. And then you look at it, it gets worse in the next one, and that is the fresh water becomes blood. And that becomes even more critical. Now, five and six. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. And then he says something interesting. They deserve it. They deserve it. <clears throat> now John hears this angel of the waters speaking. And we've seen in the Revelation that uh, there are many different activities that are assigned to different angels uh, for them to perform and carry out. And uh, here John uh, says that there's an angel then of the waters. So there's this angel over the waters. Now, this angel refers to God as who are, who were, O Holy One, and announcing Him as being righteous because He judged these things. Now, this is really important for the world to understand. You know, I said, I think it was last week, a lot of people would say, well, I'll never serve a God that would do these things, this kind of thing to, the, to people. These people have done it to themselves. God is being righteous in what He's doing. 
And you say, well, how can that be an act of righteousness? Well, it, it's just like this. Everything that has not come to a place of righteousness is going to have to be destroyed and punished. Okay? Because God's going to require righteousness. Now, He's provided the means to make the vilest sinner as righteous as God Himself as though they had never sinned. And so for someone to turn that down, then the only other alternative is to experience the righteousness of God's judgment. Because for God to be righteous, He has to judge sin. God would not be righteous if He failed to judge sin. Now, He's provided the way for that judgment. And if we will accept it, then we're made righteous of none of our, own, of our own doing. It's all because of what He's done for us. But if we reject it, the only other alternative is God has to bring judgment on us. And so, there's a real misunderstanding about God at this point. His judgment against those who reject His plan of salvation is an act of His righteousness because he has to judge sin. Now, you and I can have our sin judged by Jesus on the cross, by faith in Christ, then our sin is gone on Jesus. We're made as righteous as God himself through faith in Christ. Or, a person can reject that and then they will have to uh, face, as in this case, uh, God's judgment and wrath on earth, but then as well as throughout all eternity, his judgment will be poured out on lost people. And that judgment is a righteous act of God. He would not be righteous if he didn't do it. Now, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and their followers will have put so many Christians to death that they will deserve what they're going to receive. They poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and now God is giving the blood to drink. And the angel says they deserve it. And so that, that's what we're seeing here. They deserve it. People that go to hell will go to hell because they rejected Christ and they deserve it. They won't go to hell because they sinned. Because if that was the case, we'd all be in hell because we've all sinned. But those who respond to God's grace and mercy through faith in Christ, they're forgiven and go to heaven even though we were sinners. Those who do not accept Christ in that way, they have simply chosen a different route and they will have to be punished eternally for their sins. Never a break. An eternal punishment in hell. And as is said here about this punishment, they deserve it. The same thing can be said about those who go to hell. God didn't send them there, they sent themselves there. And because they sent themselves there, they deserve it. Okay? And that may sound harsh, but it's the fact of Scripture. And and the world is not being taught that. The world is not believing that. The world is running around and think, thinking that everybody dies and goes to heaven. It's amazing to me to sometimes hear of some particularly horrible, sinful person. I mean, everybody knows their lifestyle. There's somebody important, well-known, okay? And, and everybody knows their lifestyle. But then people were talking about it. Well, they're in a better place now. <laughs> Believe me, they're not in a better place now. Hell is not better than what we have here. The worst day we have ever had or will ever have does not compare to a day in hell. They're not in a better place. We're only in a better place when we die 
if we've accepted Christ. The blood of the Antichrist that was shed in the first half of the tribulation is simply going to result in the water turning into blood in the last part of the tribulation. So this really is God's answer to the prayers of the souls of the martyrs under the saints that we saw crying out in chapter 6. And, uh, and so God is doing what they deserve. They shed the blood of the prophets and the saints and the, and the, and the, the people of God and now he's giving the blood to drink. And that's the bottom line. Now I know there are people in places in Africa that drink blood. They kill an animal. As soon as they kill it, they slit its throat and they, they collect the blood. And many of them drink it right there on the spot. And they believe it makes them healthy and gives them strength and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, I've talked before about the fact of, of uh, like Navajo Indians, and I'm sure many of the other Indian tribes probably do the same, but I know Navajos do. They eat, uh, they eat blood. They call it blood sausage. <clears throat> and so they collect the blood from a sheep or an animal that they've killed. And uh, they take the stomach from that animal, particularly a sheep, and they pour the blood in the stomach and then they tie it off. And, uh, and then uh, soon after that, uh, when it's when it's come to the right stage it's supposed to be in, then they slice it off, and it's it's like you've seen the uh, bologna like you used used to get you get it from a big long stick and the the butcher would would uh, cut it off for you had the red ring around it. Okay, well this blood sausage of the Navajo Indians has a different ring around it, but it has a ring. And it's the, the stomach of that sheep. And the stomach of that sheep is pretty gross because it's green and it has little pimply bags all over it. And so there's this there's this congealed blood sausage that maybe they have had potatoes that they could put in it that makes it even better. And and then it's served to you with this green ring around it. And uh, I have a shovel because oftentimes I talk too much. And, uh, most of the time it's something about believing. And so I was given this shovel, graciously given it by people in the church. Well, one day on the reservation I talked too much. And I was sitting, I was trying to do a Bible study at this Hogan, and the lady was there, and her husband was there. He wasn't always there, but he, he was there that day, and, and uh, he was sitting there, and, and we were just talking, and I was, hadn't been on, we hadn't been on the reservation long, and, and I was talking about the fact of all the different uh, Native American food that I'd been able to enjoy. And I talked about having this, and having that, and having this. And I opened my big mouth. And I said, but I've not had blood sausage yet. Oh, man. Fatal. <laughs> this guy jumps up just like a bat out of hell or whatever. I mean, he just flying up to his feet. He runs out of that hogan. In a minute, he comes back. And there it is before me. <laughs> My serving of blood sausage <laughs> with the green pimply ring. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and so I had to eat it. So I ate some of it. And then I said, I'm going to save it and take the rest of it in the gym. <laughs> but you know, I was so hurt after that because it didn't come to my mind, I, I know I read it, but it didn't come to my mind that in Acts to Christians, you know, so many things have been uh, cleared in terms of us it's able for us to eat. You know, there were so many restrictions in the Old Testament, but yet there's so much liberality in the New Testament. But one thing that Christians are still told to not eat is blood. 
And boy, oh boy, a few months after that, I read that passage of scripture. And I just, I just, oh, I just felt like I had just done such a horrible thing before God by eating that blood. And I, and I didn't realize it at the time that I did it. But um, anyway, uh, it, we're not supposed to eat blood. And uh, I, they like it, but I'll tell you now, I didn't care for it. I've not had any sense. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's going to be, man, boy, I'd have to be real hungry today. <laughs> yeah. But most of the other things that they had were good. I liked it. Uh, but, but that was, and that just goes back to the, their tradition. I mean, it, that's just what they did. They killed an animal, and I'll tell you what, the part that was left of it that they didn't use in some manner, you could put in a small bag and take away. Uh, I mean, they used it all. And uh, when they killed something, particularly back in the older days, I mean, when they killed something, they, they dealt with it instantly. They cooked it instantly. They invited everybody in and they ate it right there. On the spot, uh, you know, and uh, because it may be a while before they got more food, and so in the day that we were uh, with them, the necessity of those kind of things was not that great, but the carryover was still there because you would see them when we would have potluck dinners and stuff. And they would pile up lots of food. Mm -hmm and eat it and then they would come back and they would pile up plates of food and take home because i mean this was food that was available and, and, and their custom had been just that you eat it all you may not get to eat again for a while and uh and so you have to understand things like that so that you don't think well that was rude of them or whatever it's just that's just the way the, 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 the lifestyle was. And, uh, and once you realize that, you realize they're just doing the normal thing. It, you know, it's, it's, it's us that's different from them. And, and uh, it's not necessarily that we're right, they're wrong, or, or they're right, and we're wrong. It's just the fact that's just the way it is. And so when you, you learn things like that about people, then you can, you, can, uh, you can have great respect for them, even though they're different from you the way you are and uh, there's a lot of things that, that that they could do that that I needed to learn from uh, and I never did uh, I, I needed to learn Indian time and I never did it would have been a great blessing the rest of my life if I could have grasped and lived out Indian time what I mean by that is, just get there when you get there. <laughs> It'll be okay when you get there. Yeah, don't rush. Don't be in a titter about anything. It'll be okay. You'll get there. It'll all be okay. I never could get it. I wish. You got it? A story. Oh, okay, a story. I was raised to a... Louder. First Indian Baptist Church in, uh, in LA. And, you know, a bunch of Indians. So, you know, we ran on Indian time. And we're part of this uh, Southern uh, Baptist That's the Conference. Vision. Yeah. Whatever it is. And so we have, uh, we would have missionaries come out and just help, you know, help right. us, you know, teach right. us, whatever. And there's always a white person, usually some white pastor and his wife. And uh, they would always be there spot on or early. And we'd come rolling in <laughs> 5, 10, 15, 20, half an hour late, you know, and then we'd start service. And they're always sitting there tapping their watch, looking at their watches every time you walk in the door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and one of them, I think they had an assistant guy, um, and he, he was getting a little frustrated with it. So, <laughs> He said, well, let's, he wanted to motivate us to get there early on time. 
So uh, he came up with a song. He said, well, well let's come up with a, a jingle. And uh, so he wrote it, but he said it to the tune of uh, Love Lifted Me. You know that song? Yeah. yeah. Love Lifted Me. Love. Anyway, so the song went, went like this. It was 945. I will be in Sunday school at 945. 945 sharp. <laughs> it was hard to forget a song, you know. Yeah. So we were singing this song over the weeks. And before you know it, we're all showing up at night. Wow. That's a good one. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I never got that bad. I probably looked at my watch a lot. But I didn't, I didn't write any songs or make them sing any songs. So therefore, since I didn't do that, we had Indian time. <laughs> oh boy, I can tell you another story. I'm not going to take time to tell you that. Though. Okay, now verse 7. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Here John hears the altar say, his meaning probably here is that he's hearing a voice from the altar, okay? And it says, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Thus the angel of the waters proclaims God's righteousness in his judgment. And then someone, whoever it is, I don't know, from the altar proclaims the fact that God is true and righteous in his judgments also. And uh, it's the true and righteous in the judgments that he brings against the Antichrist and those who worship him. So again, we see this emphasis being made here from heaven that God is righteous in these judgments. As we just said, I mean, it's, it, he's righteous. And he would not be righteous if he didn't judge unrighteousness. And I hope that helps helps you understand why the judgments here. Uh, why are people judged and sent to hell? It's because of his righteousness. He has to punish sin that's not dealt with. He'll cover it with the blood of Jesus and make you righteous. But if you don't do that, let him do that, then he's got to punish it. Or he would no longer be righteous. <clears throat> so I don't like that idea. Well, <clears throat> you better take that up with the creator of all the universe, including your creator. Because that's his deal. He has every right to say the way it's going to be. And we just bang our head against a, a rock wall when we go against what he says. You know, we can say it shouldn't be that way. I want it a different way. I think it should be this way. We can go like that as long as we want to. It's not going to change a thing with God. Not one thing. The Word is God's Word, and that's the way it is. And it's settled in heaven forever, and He watches over His Word to perform it. And so, we might as well just break down, give in, and do it God's way. Now, verses 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who had the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. The fourth angel will pour out his bowl on the sun, causing the sun to scorch men with fire. As a result of the fierce heat of the sun, 
they respond by blaspheming the name of God. They do not repent so as to give Him glory. Now, even though a third of the sun at this point uh, in, the, in the tribulation has been blotted out, uh, it will still be able for the rest of it to be used uh, to produce a fierce heat that will, that will scorch uh, men with fire. God has created everything so precisely that the sun now uh, blesses us. Uh, and uh, it's amazing to read or hear someone talk about just how if the sun was just the slightest bit closer or tilted in a different way or all these different things, it would destroy all of us. Instead, the way it is, it blesses us. Okay. But if it was just a tiny bit of change, it would kill us. It would curse us. And so we realize that, that God is so awesome in His creation and everything is so precise and He's created it all to bless us. But in this case, when people will not receive His blessings, they turn down His blessing, then He's going to use some of those things that have been blessings to us to become curses for us. And the Son will be used in that way. So, uh, during this last half of the tribulation, God is going to allow the Son to be an instrument of judgment instead of an instrument of blessing. And it will come on those who have chosen uh, to not follow Christ, but to follow the Antichrist. Now you would think that these people would fall down on their face and worship God when, when this happens. Uh, they would worship God who is the creator of the Son. Instead, uh, they blaspheme and they curse His name. They refuse to repent, which results in not giving Him glory. So, to repent from sin and believe in Christ is to give Him glory. <coughs> to fail to repent from sin and believe in Christ is to fail to give Him glory. Now, we need to realize something here. <clears throat> you know, we have the thought, and I just said it that way, like, my goodness, why don't they just fall down and worship God? How silly can you be? Well, <coughs> The problem is this, is that they have come to a place in which they have worshipped the image of the beast. They have taken his mark. And that act of false worship will make them doomed and incapable of turning from sin and giving them glory. So these people have already made a decision that has doomed them to hell. They're still alive, but they're doomed to hell. They can't decide for Christ. Why? Because they have already decided for the Antichrist. And there's no backing up from that. There's no reverse. There's no way out. You worship the Antichrist, <coughs> you will spend eternity in hell. Period. And that's how you can see someone in the face of all this not repent. Because they're past repenting. Their decisions have brought them to a place that they can't repent. So what a horrible position to know who God is, to know He's real, to know all that He's revealed of Himself and all these things that are happening all around them. It's screaming out of of God's power and His greatness and, and what He's doing. And they see that and they know that. But they cannot accept Christ. They cannot respond to the one who could save them and deliver them from hell. They can't do it because they've already gone too far. And, uh, and here you say, well, thankfully, you know, people still have the opportunity while we're still here now. Well, some people still do. 
God's still working with a lot of people. But there are people that are on this earth right now that are walking and breathing that have rejected God one time too many. And He's not going to deal with them anymore. He's not going to call them anymore. He's not going to, he's not going to do what it takes to bring them to Him anymore because they've just gone too far. And that's the danger that every lost person runs. That's the throwing of the dice that every lost person does. Every time they hear the gospel, they feel the drawing of God to repent and receive Christ, but they say no. And the possibility is you'll never get another chance. You have no promise of tomorrow. You could be dead tomorrow. The rapture could come this afternoon and you would be left behind in what we're reading and studying in the Revelation. You'd be left behind a little bit. And maybe he would draw you at that point. Or maybe he wouldn't. There's no way to know. But you might as well take a gun put one bullet in it, roll the chamber, pull the trigger and play what they call Russian roulette. Because that's what you're doing with yourself in eternity. Every time you knowingly reject Jesus Christ. I can't say it any plainer. So these people are truly the walking dead. Let me read from Malachi in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It speaks of this time right now that we're talking about in the tribulation. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaffed. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. How many of you have ever seen a a little young calf that's been pinned up and you turn it loose. You ever seen one? Yeah. That's exactly what they do. Yeah. They just run and kick their heels up. And, I mean, they're just the happiest thing you could ever imagine. Healthy, full of life, excited to be out, you know. They're, they're, they're just doing what they do, you know. And so this is a very vivid picture of this. So even uh, this close to the end, of the tribulation, there is hope for those who have not yet worshipped the image of the beast. There's still hope for them. And God is still seeking to get the gospel out so that those who haven't sealed their doom have another opportunity to receive it. And there will be people, it's hard to imagine how, with all the things that will be going on, but that will be alive and will be responding to Christ at this period of time. How do they get that far without being destroyed? I don't know. But truly, there will be those uh, Gentiles who have uh, accepted Christ and will make it all the way to the end of the tribulation alive. And there will be others who will make it to the end alive but who have not accepted Christ. And uh, there will be a judgment of, of, of Christ at that time. It's called the sheep and goat judgment. Uh, so those who revere the name of God will experience the healing power of God and be able to go out and leap like calves released from the straw, from the stall. What a difference in those two descriptions. Those that are doomed and those that are filled with joy and life that could be described like a, 
a young calf being released from the stall and running about kicking up its heels. So God will save all who put their trust in Him through faith in Christ. But He will punish all who refuse Him. If you're here today and you're at a point in your life that you know full well you've not accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord. You know full well that God has and is drawing you to be saved. And you're rejecting Him and you continue to reject Him. Then uh, your rejection of Him, if it is continued, will end very possibly in you going into the tribulation, not being able to be saved, enduring the tribulation, and spending eternity in hell, being punished for the sins you've committed that you refuse to let Jesus forgive. And I would encourage you, if you fall into that category, to change that today through faith in if you're a Christian and you're here and you've never followed Jesus in water baptism, I would encourage you to come and talk to me after the service. Let's make plans for you to do that next week. We're having baptismal service at Charmin's in the hot tub. Okay? So it'll, it'll, be, it'll be a merciful thing on you. If you're a Christian and you need to recommit your life to Christ, I encourage you to do that today. And if you need prayer or counsel for any reason, I encourage you to receive that. Uh, we need to remember Jim Nemo and his wife Barb passed um, Friday. Yeah. And then also Guy, um, if yes. she is husband. I talked to her. Um, he will be in probably another five more days on antibiotics. She asked that they pray to find out what caused this and that his heart stays in its normal rhythm. Blood pressure's at normal range right now, but he's uh, collecting fluid throughout his body. So. And they don't know why. This is Elisha's husband. He's been really, really, really sick this past week. And, uh, and Jim Nemo, you may not know who that is, but uh, back years ago, several years ago, he led worship for us. And uh, we we're still at the bar, and he led worship for us when we first came here also. Uh, his wife died this past week and they'd only been married their uh, first year anniversary was uh, the 19th of this month and uh, I know that he's devastated uh, because of that and so please pray for him and, and also pray for Alicia and her husband thank you for reminding me of those, those two prayer needs our ministry team will be to the right of the room at the close of the service. Go back and share with them uh, what it is that you need uh, prayer for or ministry concerning whatever it is. Uh, our offering bucket is to the left of the doors as you exit. If you'd like to participate in the ministry of this church, we'd like to encourage you to drop in your tithes and offerings. And may I say thank you for, for doing so and allowing us to continue to move forward as a church and continue to move forward in the areas of ministry outside the walls of our church that we're still able to be involved in. We're thankful for that. We praise God for that. We thank you uh, for that and making that possible. So, uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. Remember the potluck next week and uh, those other events. And I hope you have a great rest of the week. Pray for those that we've mentioned. Uh, as you think about the truth of and, uh, and we'll see you again soon. You're dismissed.